Um, well, welcome everyone to our uh, virtual library lecture. Uh, my name is Kristen Muller and I'm the director of Peters Valley School of Craft, which is in Layton, New Jersey. Um, and we teach immersive craft workshops. We have a gallery, we have exhibitions, we have a gift shop, an online shop, and we host an annual craft fair this year, obviously with our um, COVID-19 pandemic, we are doing things virtually. And uh, in the past, we have held these lectures, these artist lectures in the Pike County Library. And um, we are so graciously funded by the Richard L. Snyder Fund and the Greater Pike County Community Foundation to bring programs to Pike County. And um, we're very grateful that the Pike County Library and the Greater Pike County Community Foundation um, embraced the idea of doing our virtual artist lectures. So tonight, um, we are very excited to welcome Timothy Jacobson. And Tim, um, I met him at Hood College, where I sometimes teach for their graduate ceramics program. And Tim has been teaching uh, photography there for many years. He's a photojournalist and a freelance photographer who's been working for um, almost 30 years. He grew up outside of Chicago and graduated from Winona State University in Minnesota with a BA in mass communications. His desire to tell stories with photographs and his passion for the outdoors fuel his desire to constantly create new and inspiring images. He's based out of Frederick, Maryland, which is a beautiful, beautiful town. He had done work for the Washington Post, the Associated Press, Niche Magazine, Maryland Life Magazine, Outdoor Magazine, the Sierra Club, Garrett County Chamber of Commerce, and several state and country tourism boards, as well as countless other regional publications. Currently, he's a lecturer at Hood College and the University of Maryland's Philip Merrill College of Journalism, and he teaches multimedia journalism and photography. So today, Tim, welcome. We're looking forward to you taking us on your journey. I'm gonna hand it over to you. A couple, Hello. Of, th couple of things, so I forgot. Yeah, I'm gonna. We've got a, this is a webinar format. So we don't see any of the participants, but we encourage anyone who's got questions, if you scroll to the very bottom of your screen, there's a little Q and A box. If you have questions throughout the lecture, please post them there. And at the end, when Tim finishes, we will um, answer some of them, hopefully all of them. So thank you, sorry about that. Welcome, Tim. Oh, thanks, Kristen. Um, first off, just let me say uh, thank you to Peters Valley. Um, if you don't know about Peters Valley, um, get to know more about it. So it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing school. Um, it's like Kristen said, it's an immersive, um, situation where you're living on campus. Um, you're around other like-minded creative people, whether it's photography people, whether it's pottery people, whether it's fiberware, uh, metalworking, woodworking, whatever it may be. Um, it's a great experience, uh, to be in that kind of situation. And plus that the Valley is, uh, amazing. Um, I'm going to start here and uh, I'm going to get in my uh, in my mode. Um, so what I'm going to do today um, is uh, what I normally teach at Peters Valley is um, kind of updating the classic landscape, how to get better landscape photos. Um, mostly because I think a lot of people that's what a lot of people like taking photos of. It's something that's very accessible. Um, it gets you out into nature. Um, the equipment that you need uh, isn't extensive. It can be expensive, but it's not extensive. Um, when I go out nowadays, I carry uh, um, one lens, one body, a tripod, and a couple extra batteries, and that's it. Um, very minimalistic. Um, and I'm big on analogies. And one thing that I always talk about, and I think it's a great analogy, is taking landscape photos is like making grilled cheese. Um, everybody can make a grilled cheese sandwich and everybody can take a landscape photo. 
but if you want to make a really good grilled cheese sandwich, you need to be a little creative. Um, you need to buy some good ingredients. You need to do some uh, kind of uh, pre-assembly of stuff. So you need to think about when you're going to make the sandwich, what your ingredients are. Um, and then, you know, you just need to be, you know, uh, kind of be able to roll with the punches when things don't go well. Um, and that's, I think, very much into landscape photography. Um, I'm going to start uh, just showing you guys this a, a quick black and white. Um, and this is from a trip that uh, my kids and I took um, over Christmas. Uh, we went out to uh, the Sierra Nevadas. And what we decided to do was... Uh, we were gonna do Mount Whitney and Death Valley. Uh, and we stayed at a little town uh, right outside Mount Whitney called Lone Pine, California, um, which Lone Pine is exactly what it sounds like. It's, you know, it was a, an old cowboy town um, and we had planned to, to hike Mount Whitney and we had planned to go to Death Valley. Um, the problem was when you get up to Mount Whitney in the wintertime and they don't tell you, um, they close the roads when there is a certain amount of snow. So it was closed, but lucky for us, um, there's a, a park um, just below the Sierra Nevadas near Mount Whitney called Alabama Hills. And it's an amazing place with some amazing rock formations. Um, if you're um, a fan of um, Iron Man, um, you'll notice, uh, you'll, you'll see Alabama Hills and Iron Man. Um, you'll see uh, places like this. Um, and uh, when I go out and I photograph, um, and my kids will tell you this, um, I'm a horrible person to go out um, to places like this because I tend to forget that everybody's there. And I want to go off on my own and I don't want to stay with the group. Um, I'm a horrible person. I, I would never want to go on like, hey, let's go do the tourist thing because you're on a schedule and I just want to go out and I want to do. Um, they've gotten comfortable with that now. Um, but I, I tend to do my best work when I'm on my own. And I think most photographers do their best work uh, when they're on their own when there are no distractions, when you're not worried about having a conversation with somebody and you can just concentrate on what's in front of you, um, figure out what's important to you and let images just kind of reveal themselves. I think if you're gonna be a good landscape photographer or almost any other kind of photographer, but a lot of it relates to landscape photography is you have to be very, very patient. Um, because the good photos, the good compositions don't present themselves right, right away. Um, you have to kind of let them reveal themselves. So um, you kind of have to move around a little bit. You kind of have to wait. Um, so for, for this image here, um, I was just kind of like walking around, um, trying to look and find a way. And if you look like this, I hope you can see my pointer. Um, the peak that's right here on the left, that's Mount Whitney. And then if I go to the next one, that's the peak right there. So that's Mount Whitney. Um, this looks like it's higher, but this is actually farther back. So it's actually higher. Um, the rock formation here is called Mobius Rock. Um, it's kind of a, uh, from what I understand, um, kind of a tourist spot there. We didn't see a lot of people there. It's not an easy place to get to. It's not an easy place to get this photograph from. Um, I'm basically teetering at the edge of a little cliff because this rock here basically drops about 30 feet and then there's a little rock on the other side. Um, but it took me a while just to kind of figure out, you know, this composition and what I wanted and how much sky I wanted, how much foreground I wanted. Um, and then it was just a matter of, you know, um, waiting, you know, uh, for you know, the sun to be, uh, I didn't wait a long time, but I wanted um, a little bit of shadow. 
Um, this is also, again, this is also in, uh, in Alabama Hills. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's my daughter. I, I kind of let her in there just to give you a, a size perspective. And I think this is an interesting photo just because it's a little bit different. And it's an image that um, you really need to know your camera settings to get this image. Um, if you're a landscape photographer and you're not documenting in manual mode, um, please document in manual mode. Uh, document in manual mode, document in raw mode. Um, and uh, once you get those two together and to kind of work together, um, uh, you know, um, the world is kind of your oyster, so to speak. But um, an image like this, this is probably, um, I was probably shooting at like ISO 100, um, probably 250th of a second and probably like F16. Um, for it's like this to get that sun flare in the background. Um, this is probably still at ISO 100, but I'm probably shooting at like a three thousandth of a second. Um, because if I didn't shoot at such a high shutter speed, um, because I'm shooting into the sun, um, the sky would be all blown out. Um, and um, I kind of wanted that, that lens flare and that sun to be in there. Um, I also did a little bit of work um, in Lightroom to bring out some shadows in here. Um, I took the shadow slider and the black slider and kind of slid them to the right just a little bit um, to get a little bit. You can actually see there's a little bit of, uh, of lens flare right here. Uh, and there's also a little bit at the bottom but I wanted to get a little bit of detail in the shadows. I didn't want a full on um, silhouette because uh, I think all that uh, kind of character of the rock really stands out. Um, we did get to Death Valley. Um, the images that I'm showing are not gonna be your typical Death Valley uh, barren images, but this is, uh, it's an unbelievable area of Death Valley called the Artist Palette, um, and you can actually look at why. Um, depending on the amount of oxygen and depending on what minerals and um, uh, other kind of features of the rock are being exposed to the air, the rock changes to a different color. Um, and there's a lot of borax, there's a lot of calcite, um, and there's a lot of other minerals out there that turn the rock kind of this really cool kind of turquoise green, but it'll also turn, you can see in the shadows here, it'll also turn it purple. And then there's some oranges. Um, so it was an unbelievable place just to kind of go and just walk. Um, there is a trail that will lead you uh, along the floor, but um, there's no stopping you from just crawling up a peak and walking up there. And you have no idea when's the last time somebody's walked up there before. Um, I tried to uh, stay away from as many people as possible. Um, we got there very early in the morning um, from Lone Pine to get to Death Valley. That's the one thing about Death Valley is the closest town to Death Valley is two and a half hours away. Um, there's a, a resort in Death Valley that you can stay at if you want to fork over five, six hundred dollars a night, or if you want to uh, stay, there's a couple local campgrounds. <clears throat> but we stayed in Lone Pine and it was a, a two and a half hour drive. So we left, uh, I think we left about five o'clock in the morning so we could get there um, really early in the morning to get that really nice uh, morning sun. So this is Artist Palette. Um, it really doesn't do it justice. And the next couple slides that I'm gonna show you guys, it's, it's a technique. Um, there we go, there we go. Um, this is panorama um, and the way this is constructed and I didn't crop this, this is basically just put together, um, but it's a technique where you take a series of overlapping vertical photos. And then in Photoshop, um, there is a function called Merge. And you can take that series of images 
and it will merge them together into a panorama like this. Um, it's a pretty straightforward technique. It takes a little bit to get used to. You have to be very, very um, level as you go from right to or right to left, from left to right, and you have to overlap your images by at least thirty percent. Um, you also have to make sure um, you're in manual mode because all your exposures need to be exactly the same and you can't change your focal length. So if you have a zoom lens, uh, you have to set your focal length and make sure it doesn't change. But what this does, and you can do something like this, I'm sure everybody's done this on their iPhone, but what it does is it gives you a huge file. Um, I could have very easily taken this photo with a 16 millimeter lens but there's gonna be a little distortion. So what um, photo merge allows you to do is, again, you turn your camera vertically. And so this is probably my, maybe a 35 or a 50 millimeter lens. And you take a series of overlapping photos. Um, and this image is 147 inches wide and it's 60 something inches deep. So it's a huge photo um, display options are amazing. Um, but you would really never get this type of image um, with just a regular um, kind of straightforward, you know, uh, wide angle lens. And I have a couple different examples. And again, these are, these are not cropped. I would go in and I would crop this uh, out. Um, this is back at Alabama Hills looking at Mount Whitney. Um, there's no way you could get that um, just with a straightforward lens. Um, this is a, a shallow lake. Um, this was in the morning when we were driving to uh, Death Valley. This is actually in Death Valley. And if you can see on the left-hand side, this is the road, and this is a completely straight road. Um, on the left-hand side, you can just see the side of the road. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the road um, kind of trailing off. Um, so like I said, um, it gives you a, a, a new way to look at landscapes. Um, it's very, uh, for a landscape, I usually don't like putting my horizon line right in the middle. Uh, but when you do a panorama, you're kind of stuck that way or else you're going to get distortion and things don't come together. Right. Um, but you can do something like that. Um, this is up at, uh, this is not out west. Um, this is uh, up in uh, Deep Creek, Maryland, in Western Maryland. Uh, I do a lot of photography for their uh, tourism council and their chamber of commerce. And in the summertime, um, they basically uh, rent me a boat. And my job is just to go out and take photos of people out in the lake. And they're very adamant about um, good sunset images. So I stay out until after sunset. Um, just kind of sitting and bobbing in the water, trying to find the best vantage point uh, to get uh, a good image uh, like that. Um, this is uh, this is back out west. Um, this is a place um, called Fossil Falls, um, and this is looking uh, towards the Sierra Nevadas. Um, Fossil Falls is a really cool spot uh, that we just kind of um, fell upon. Uh, we were walking in town and uh, we went to an outdoor store and I asked uh, the guy behind the desk, look, you know, are there any other places that we can go to that are kind of hidden gems that not a lot of people know about? And he said, oh yeah, there's this cool place called Fossil Falls about 25 miles away. Um, it used to be an old lava flow and there's all this volcanic rock um, and there's all this shrubbery and greenage there that, you know, um, isn't anywhere else. And we were like, all right, you know, <laughs> that sounds interesting. And it was about um, about a half mile walk uh, in, and then the topography kind of changed to this. Uh, you can see a very uh, kind of uh, volcanic style rock. Um, and there's not a lot of saturation in this image. This is what it looks like when we were there. Um, I think black and white does uh, uh, an, an amazing thing um, with a uh, with a topography like this, um, and what Photoshop and what um, Lightroom allow you to do, 
um, which um, taking that image or that location and turning it into black and white is it allows you to, to play with the color channels. Um, so I can lighten and darken just those yellow, yellow color channels, or I can lighten and darken just the blue color channels. So um, in this image, I really uh, darkened down uh, the blue and the cyan color channels, and then all these yellows and tans for all these uh, scrub kind of brushes, um, I really lighten them up a little bit and then kind of uh, played around with the contrast uh, just a little. Um, this is also uh, Fossil Falls. Uh, I think it's really important. Um, I don't need to be skipping around, but if you're going to go to somewhere where you've never been before, um, especially if it's, if it's like a state park or a national park or a scenic area, um, talk to some of the locals um, and ask them places that they go. Talk to a park ranger or a DNR or somebody from Fish and Wildlife and say, hey, you know, where are the places that you go that are away from, you know, all the tourist spots? Um, they're the ones that will give you uh, the honest information on where to go. Um, that's what I always try and do if I'm going to go to someplace new is um, I'll still look up online places to go. But when I go there, if I can find somebody, I, I want to talk to them and I want to find the places that are a little bit out of the way. Um, I had um, a conversation. This is uh, Desolation Canyon. This is also, this is more what you would think of it in Death Valley. But I had a conversation with uh, a friend of mine and she was like, oh boy, you know, wouldn't you, wouldn't you love to, to go over to Paris and, and photograph the tower and all that? And I said, I said, yeah, you know, I, I want to go to Paris, but I'm like, I don't know if I necessarily want to go for the Eiffel Tower. And she kind of looked at me funny. And I said, look, if I'm going to go to Paris, I want to go to the side streets of Paris. I want to go to the places that the tourists don't go. I've seen the Eiffel Tower and I'll photograph the Eiffel Tower, but I want to find the places that other people haven't seen before. And I want to photograph those places in a way that nobody has seen before. Um, that's kind of my motivation uh, for going to places like this. I want to find ways to document locations that nobody has ever documented before. Because um, I can see all that stuff, you know. Um, I've seen it in National Geographic, and I've seen it in slideshows, and I've seen it all over. But, you know, I want to find the, the areas that, you know, that nobody has ever looked at before. Um, this is Desolation Canyon. Um, Again, it's in uh, uh, Death Valley. Um, it might look familiar. It, you might also know it as Tatooine, um, the original Star Wars movie. Um, this is the when R2-D2 goes rogue to go and find um, Obi-Wan. Um, this is the kind of area that he went up before, um, you know, meeting the sand people and all that. I don't want to get too geeky, but... Uh, um, it's kind of an interesting landscape, completely different. Um, it's just a lot of rock, but it's kind of a fun place to go. Um, this um, is also in Death Valley. Uh, this is probably my favorite photo that I took from Death Valley. Um, this is in a place called Mesquite Flats, and it's basically a sand dune area as you're coming into Death Valley. It's probably about 10, 15 miles outside of uh, what's called Badwater Basin, uh, which is the lowest part of Death Valley. And the reason I like this uh, is, um, <laughs> I think my kids were a little bit, I don't think they were a lot annoyed, but we got really early in the morning uh, to leave Lone Pine to drive uh, to Death Valley. Um, it's a lot earlier than they, usually get up, uh, they slept more away. But when you get to an area like this, just as the sun is coming up and the colors are so intense and so vibrant and the sand is cool and there's not a lot of people around, um, that makes for a special moment. Um, and this photo, um, when you talk about patience, um, there were a lot of people around, not a ton of people, but there were people kind of scampering around. Um, I knew that this was the photo I wanted. I, I think I got lucky that just the tip of this 
um, piece of mesquite was sticking up along the shadow line from the, from the mountains. But just being patient to wait for a time when there wasn't anybody in the background um, was really important to me. And I was willing to do that. Um, I, you know, wanted to go run around the sand dunes and I wanted to find other places, but um, the color intensity of this uh, one piece of mesquite um, just kind of said something to me, like, this is going to be a, a cool photo. So I literally like, I think it was probably like 10, 15 minutes, just on my knees, waiting for everybody to not be in the background, um, making sure that I had my focus right, making sure that I had um, all my uh, exposure settings right. Um, and uh, yeah, that one, you know, uh, I think was, was kind of cool. Um, if I don't have a tripod and I'm in a situation like this and I know I want to use a slow shutter speed and I need to be relatively still, um, I will put my camera on motor drive. Um, and what I do is I will take three photos in motor drive. Um, and my thinking, and it's worked, is um, the majority of the time, if you're shooting with a slow shutter speed and you don't have a camera, um, the motion blur you're getting is when you are either depressing the shutter button or releasing the shutter button. That's when you get a little bit of camera shake. So the reason I take three really fast is that middle image, my finger's not moving. So I'll take three photos or five photos and I'll do it. I'll put my camera on the fastest motor drive it, it, it has. That middle frame will be the sharpest frame. And then the first and the third will be a little blurry. Um, so that's uh, kind of an interesting technique that I do. Uh, if I'm gonna document uh, at anything under than like a 30th of a second and I don't have a tripod or if something's going to be moving and I, you know, uh, I don't want to uh, kind of push up my ISO. Um, and this is another image where um, documenting in RAW and being able to edit in Lightroom can save an image because um, being able to play around with the shadow slider and that black slider um, really gives uh, a lot of kind of detail into these mountains uh, that are on the opposite side of this lake, but still maintain uh, the silhouette uh, of our figure kind of standing there. This was from vacation um, just a couple weeks ago. Again, this is on the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, this is sunrise about uh, 5.30, 5.45 in the morning, um, just after sunrise. And uh, again, this is kind of um, the house that we stay at. We look east uh, over Assateague Island. If everybody knows the story about Misty of Chincoteague, um, you'll kind of know where we're at. Um, but, and this is where, you know, I kind of get into this. I don't want to take photos of the Eiffel Tower. If I wake up and I'll get up before sunrise, if I get up and there's no clouds in the sky and it's just a normal sunrise morning, like I'll go back to bed. <laughs> I'm like, eh, just another sunrise, big deal. Because I've seen it so many times before and it's just this, you know, not to, you know, disparage it. It's a beautiful sunrise, but I want something different. And I woke up this morning and there was this fog bank uh, that was kind of creeping across uh, the channel. Uh, and I was taking photos and luckily, you know, for me, I had a, a stand-up paddler and a kayaker kind of just drift into view. Um, I dropped my horizon line just a little bit. Uh, I wanted to maintain the shadow here, or not the shadow, the reflection uh, of the sun on the water, but I didn't want that horizon line uh, right in the middle. Um, this is from the same morning, um, looking, uh, out onto, uh, Assateague Island. And this is from, uh, the second floor of the house that we stay at. Um, every other morning, it's just, you know, uh, you know, blue sky and, you know, uh, green marsh. But on this morning, it was, like I said, there was this really cool fog 
that had ruled in. And uh, I knew that um, a little longer lens, this was a, uh, uh, this was the 70, 7,200 millimeter uh, f2.8 lens um, that, uh, that I shot um, just to get a little bit closer to the trees. Um, I didn't do a lot of editing with this image. Um, with this one uh, and this one, there wasn't a lot of editing uh, to be done. Um, I, I think I may have made this a little bit more pastel but that's about it. Um, this is uh, uh, on Assateague Island. This, this is uh, sunset. Um, I always find it interesting um, when we're down uh, on the shore and everybody's taking photos of the sunset. And then as soon as the sun drops below the horizon, everybody leaves. I'm like, where are you going? Like, this is when like magic happens. Uh, after the sun drops and you can see the sun is dropping right here. That's the sun that just went down. Um, but that's when the colors get good. Um, that's when the cloud formations get um, more texture. Um, and for me, that's, that's the really cool part uh, is after the sun has gone down. Um, this image took a lot of editing. Um, this is on the, on the marsh on Assateague on the way back. Um, way past sunset. Um, and again, um, working with uh, uh, the raw image. And, and again, if you're not documenting in raw, please document in raw. Having all that extra information in your image um, is really going to help you when you're editing an image that needs a little work. And this image needed a little work um, because if I didn't edit it, um, this would all just be black and it wouldn't have just a little bit of texture in there. Um, I'm going to go through these next ones uh, kind of quick. Um, completely scares to winter time. Um, this is just a, an image from uh, up in uh, near Deep Creek in Garrett County in the winter time, just walking through the woods. Uh, it's, it's actually a golf course. Um, I was actually supposed to be getting photos of people on uh, sleigh rides um, and I was waiting for them and just uh, took this photo and then uh, changed it to black and white. And even uh, in Lightroom, or even if you're, if you're editing in Photoshop in the raw bay, you can still have control of the color channels if you change your image to black and white. It just lightens or darkens that color channel. Um, some of you, I know Kristen's gonna, uh, this may look familiar, this is Child's Park. Um, up in the valley. Um, it's just a long exposure of a waterfall. Um, anytime I'm going to go out and I know I'm going to be taking photographs of water or document images of water, I take neutral density filters with me. Um, and if you don't know what a neutral density filter is, it's basically just a square piece of glass that is colored gray and they have different um, values to them where the neutral density filter will cut the light by a certain amount. And what it does is it'll cut the light by a certain amount so you can take an image with a longer exposure. So if you want to get that kind of like soft pillowy feel and satiny feel of uh, a waterfall uh, and you can't do it, you can put a neutral density filter in and it might take your 15th second or a third of a second uh, shutter speed to a second or a second and a half. Um, I think the image is okay in black and or in, in color. Um, I like it a lot better in black and white. Um, I think black and white, I'm a huge Ansel Adams fan. So I think when uh, images are in black and white, people pay attention more textures. Um, they don't get caught up in the colors. Um, and there are certain instances where I think black and white uh, works really, really well. Um, uh, this is this is also from the beach. This is me messing around. Um, this is long exposure, and I'm going to be completely honest with you. I took this with my iPhone. Um, I have uh, on my iPhone. I think I have at least eight or nine different cameras. 
on my iPhone, and this is taken with a slow shutter app. Uh, it's basically a second and a half handheld uh, image that I took with my iPhone, but I, I really liked um, the kind of pastel kind of feel to this. Um, I, and I will totally admit, I do a lot of stuff uh, with my iPhone uh, these days. Um, get pretty decent images if you find the right app and you handle your iPhone correctly. Um, you know, you can do a lot of really, really cool things. Um, and uh, these, the last two, that one and this one, uh, were both taken with uh, an iPhone. Um, this image was taken with, uh, um, uh, it's an HDR app, it's called HDR Pro, and HDR stands for high dynamic range. Um, and what uh, HDR does is it takes three images really, really quick, um, an overexposed image, a properly exposed image, and then an underexposed image. And then it will blend those three images together to create an image that has a higher dynamic range um, than you normally would have. Um, and again, this <laughs> not that this took me a lot of time, but if you want to get good photo times, you kind of have to sacrifice. Um, to get this photo, I basically, um, I was barefoot and I waded out into uh, this little marshy area. And I think I was uh, about six inches uh, above my ankle in muck uh, to get this photo. And, and uh, when you're six inches in muck and you're bending down to try and get a photo that's very, very low, um, you're not balanced very well. So, um, it was uh, it was hit or miss whether I was going to fall forward or backward. So this is this is up on Thunder Mountain where the photo studio used to be, um, and now it's back down um, in I think kind of the main area. But this is uh, an um, before uh, before we were meeting for class. Um, I thought it would be appropriate to end on that. Um, if anybody's thinking about taking any kind of classes uh, at Peters Valley or anything. Um, I encourage you to do that. Um, taking classes like you can at Peters gives you the opportunity to ask questions of people who can give you honest answers. Um, they're going to put you in situations where you can practice your skills. Um, that is a very comforting situation. Um, and again, whether that's ceramics or photography or textiles or what, whatever it is, um, Taking a class there, um, I think, is only going to make you better at what you do. Um, and the only other thing I can say is if you want to get better at what you do, do more of it. Um, the only way you're going to be a better photographer is to go out and take more photos. The only way you're going to be a better potter is to, you know, um, you know, make more pots or make more sculptures. The only way you're going to make, you know, uh, be a better blacksmith is to, you know, uh, you know, put yourself in front of a fire and, you know, start, start pounding on metal. Um, if anybody uh, wants to contact me, if you have questions later, if you want to follow me on Instagram, <coughs> feel free to do that. Um, there's my information right there.